It's called a wedge issue. It's a, an issue over which political parties try to force the other into awkward spots to either defend or decry an issue, and gun control is one of those wedge issues. It's also an issue that puts the sharp urban-rural divide into very focused relief. We've got farmers and hunters for whom the gun is a tool, and we've got people who live in our cities. There have They have very little experience with guns, except where they are in the hands of criminals committing violent crimes. So it's back on the political table again. The government has uh, forced its legislation forward, and it's about to land in the Senate. So we are going to a person who really has been wrestling with this issue. Robert Freeberg is Saskatchewan's chief firearms officer. He was named to that position in 2020 because a lot of this legislation kind of goes back and forth uh, between the two jurisdictions, federal and provincial. So he was appointed by the Premier to take a look at this. Now, Mr. Freeberg has lots of uh, experience in the issue. He's uh, passed board member of the Saskatoon Wildlife Federation. He was CEO of Brigadier Security Systems, an elite security systems, member of the National Board of Directors of the Canadian Sports Shooting Association, all of these things. He brings expertise to the table. So thank you for joining us, Mr. Freeberg, for this edition of No Nonsense, no Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. Welcome. Thanks, thank you so much for inviting me. Here we are in Saskatchewan where we've got a rainy day, but let's get into the um, the message here. Uh, this is really one of those issues that divides us along uh, rural and urban lines, but also just beyond that. There are lots of people who live in cities that sport shoot and have other things. Uh, what do you see is the purpose of gun control legislation? What is it supposed to do? Well, it's supposed to, and, and what we're committed to here in Saskatchewan within our office is public safety. I mean, it's it's public safety, it's education to promote public safety, and to keep people in compliance with the legislation by providing them with the information and, and, and frankly, a contact that they can actually reach that's going to be able to answer their questions. It's become um, much beyond just the regulation or the licensing of gun owners or setting standards for how you move guns around or or transport them. Um, and we've kind of lost sight of the issue, which is to try and reduce illegal guns, not not deal with legal guns that that people use for many purposes. Well, there's no question, and and really the focus of, of the chief arms offices across Canada, including Saskatchewan, where we've now taken that responsibility over from the federal government. It was initially run by the RCMP, you know, mm -hmm. prior to the province and you know our premier and cabinet choosing to go that direction. But really, it's it's first of all, it's vetting people who want to apply for a firearms license to make sure that they've received the proper training, they don't have uh, any criminal history that would prevent them along with mental health issues, domestic violence issues, the list goes on and on. Of, of, and so, again, firearms owners are heavily vetted uh, through not only the process that the RCMP conducts in Miramichi, but also in our office. But then the second component of that, of course, is they're in the training, you know, there's compliance around storage, storage requirements, uh, securing the firearms and ammunition, those sort of things, which are, again, a responsibility of the CFO offices to not only enforce, but to regulate and educate. And so, again, another major responsibility. But again, when someone does go afoul of that, because of uh, interaction with police, uh, domestic violence reports of uh, concerns, those those need to come back to the, to the CFO offices and do, where their fair and reasonable and prompt investigation has to ensue. And in some cases, there's malicious reasons for why the person has been reported and there's no wrongdoing. And our investigation determines that there isn't a public safety risk to themselves or others. But then on the same token, there's ones that do, which then need to be, you know, the license needs to be uh, revoked. And in some cases, um, you know, the person's been prohibited by the courts and so forth, which again, that information has to go through to the firearms office. So, you know, we do have investigators that investigate those and we work alongside law enforcement to yeah. 
to make sure that that's happening. But again, the businesses are also regulated by our office as well. Right, the 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 sale and whatnot. The the problem that we've got is, of course, this has become so politicized. The government has been very confused with this particular piece of legislation, adding amendments and removing the amendments and and uh, short circuiting the whole process of debate and hearing from people like you about what the issues and concerns are, along with the indigenous community and police chiefs and whatnot. Um, so ha- have we lost sight of what this is about? Um, because as I say, there's an awful lot of people who like to hunt or sport shoot or whatever it is. And all of this focus seems to be on guns that exist in the hands of people who have a legal right to own them, as opposed to the criminals who use illegal guns to commit crime. Well, and it's a huge issue, Senator. I mean, one of the things that I learned when I took over this role, and I, you know, I basically came out of retirement to do this because I'm passionate about it. And I've been involved in it for 40 years, so I really didn't need this job from a financial right. compensation. But I really enjoy what I'm doing because of, you know, as a responsible firearms owner myself, you know, I wanted to see that, you know, we're not, you know, we're dealing with the people who aren't responsible. And to, to you know, I was disappointed when we took over this program. I mean there was files that were 800 days old that hadn't been addressed, you know, and, and we were able to get on top of them and address them in 24 hours. In fact, in the province right now, we have more than doubled in some cases, tripled the number of investigations and revocations around individuals who may present a risk to themselves and others. So we're doing the important work right. um, to make sure that people that shouldn't have guns don't have guns, but many parts of the country and including with this C-21 coming out, I mean, there's new a red flag laws, yellow flag laws, but unless you have adequate resources, both in the firearms offices and police to actually go out and do that important work, it's not of any effect. I mean, you send someone a letter and say, well, you know, you have 30 days to get rid of your guns. Well, if no one's following up and no one's going to the door and finding out that they've been disposed of, or in some cases, maybe they shouldn't have 30 days, maybe it should be immediate, but you need resources to do that. So when you talk about losing sight, I mean, I think the firearm legislation and many of the firearms owners agree with the training, the licensing, exactly. and all of the things that are in place. But now those same com- things that they've done to stay in compliance and they've actually promoted. I mean, it's our firearms community that's delivering the education programs and and supporting it. And our gun store owners that are reporting people that are doing things that they feel are suspicious. I mean, they're very supportive of public safety, but now they're being targeted, pardon the expression. Yep, legislation that's going to take away the firearms when they've been the ones actually, you know, advocating for the licensing and registration of firearms. And now by doing so, have actually put themselves in a situation of having their property expropriated. Yeah. You have just uh, come back from a meeting of uh, chiefs of police in Saskatchewan. Was it just provincial police chiefs or people from a broader? No, it was, it was provincial police chiefs and deputy chiefs. Uh, and, and other is, support agencies, you know, from government and others that support law enforcement efforts in the province. And what are they saying about this? What was the debate? I mean, with well, this- the challenges that they have is that they don't want to be put in a situation where they're the middleman. I mean, they right. are there to enforce the law and they will. So, I mean, if the law comes out and says that these firearms are illegal and you can't own them anymore and the police are put in an unfortunate situation of having to enforce that, um, they will. And but again, the the challenge is while they're doing that, there's many, many other things that aren't happening. So really, I don't know that anyone has come up with a solution as to how we're going to deal with that, how we're going to have the police basically become, you know, repos- you know, you know, repo depot, you yeah. know, type folks, which is, you know, I understand why the government wants to have them do that because of their training. But at the same time, while they're going over to a law abiding orders home to get their firearm to to comply with the legislation, what's happening with the illegal people that yeah they're right, not they're not getting not a fighting business. crime so, yeah so you know the, I think they want to make sure that people in Saskatchewan are able to have a uh, you know some way to to comply with this law so that they don't all become criminals overnight and they're yeah and so at the same token they have that weighing on them but at the same time they're trying to deal with issues you know where we had the tragedy of James Smith and trying to make sure we do more work in that area to avoid those kind of tragedies happening again in the province. So, you know, there's, 
And again, the consensus that I'm hearing is that they don't have a problem with law-abiding gun owners. And yeah. they're very happy and supportive of what the CFO office is doing in Saskatchewan to make sure that we keep people law-abiding. Well, the the deaths at James Smith Cree Nation were also, I mean, that that was that was knife violence, not gun violence, but but the issue is violence. People are being killed with weapons who that become assault weapons, depending on how they're used. A knife as well. Well, there's no question. And, you know, really, and, and we're doing something about this. I mean, in Saskatchewan, which I, I'm very proud of, our government yeah. has provided 100% of the funding for our office, which is almost $8 million now. I mean, you know, it was, uh, it's, it started out as like a $1.2 million project, but when we saw the need, our you know, our government responded, and I've been very happy with that. And one of the reasons why I'm very committed. But we've been discussing with you know with PA Grand Council and others about methods that we can have to make sure that the people in their communities are in compliance, more so around the safe storage and education. Because going back to the James Smith issue, I mean, there was a knife involved, but you know, heaven forbid, if that person had gone into one of those homes and found an unsecured firearm, and now. Yeah moved it up a notch. So what we're doing is we're saying, well, you know, thank God that didn't happen, but we don't want to sit back and wait for it to happen. So we want to go up there and work with the community in, you know, hand in hand with the Indigenous community to say, well, what can we do recognizing the Indigenous rights to hunt and so forth, which I'm a big proponent of. Right. I mean, as you know, I was one of the first wildlife federations in Canada to sign a, you know, a MOU with the Saskatoon Tribal Council to, yeah. because we have the same common love. We love going on hunting. We love our heritage and and we want responsible use of firearms ownerships and the training and, and mentoring that goes along with that. So we're we're working hard in Saskatchewan to develop an integrated approach. But again, none of that is in C21. These are initiatives that we've done on our own. And you can make all the laws in the world, but if you don't have education and you don't have the enforcement um, regulatory side behind it and the partnerships with, you know, again, First Nation and non-First Nation communities, it's not going to be successful. Well, and and it's it's interesting because the in, Indigenous communities have said, look, these are our traditional rights and we want to be able to hunt and fish and do all of that. But but that's a growing issue for a lot of people. I know I, I got some pushback on this in Ottawa, but with the rate of food inflation at this point, I've got members of my family that hunt and they put it in the deep freeze and they eat it. Um, and that that's a that that's an important part of this issue too. That we have to keep in balance how the different perspectives on what guns are used for. Well, and Senator, I think that's one of the things that I've been speaking to, and I spoke to Sarm and Sum. I mean, I've been I've been working pretty pretty hard out here to get the message. Yeah, yeah, that's rural municipalities and urban municipalities. Yeah, yeah. and I and in Saskatchewan, I must say, like in Saskatoon, for example, which is an urban community. I mean, uh, Mayor Charlie Clark is very supportive of what we're doing and actually has been quite supportive of law-abiding firearms owner being able to keep their firearms. In fact, you know, they they are not in favor of um, using city police to go out and do confiscations. Right. So, um, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're looking at in the urban areas like Saskatoon, I mean, the Saskatoon Wildlife Federation has 3,500 members. It's the largest wildlife federation probably in Western Canada. Well, that and I and again I reminded some of our folks that that isn't be, you know that isn't because they're all hunters. Some of them are target shooters. Some of them are hunters. Right. But the mythology that well this is an urban rural issue may not necessarily be the case in every community. Maybe in Toronto more so, but here yes, I think there's so. probably as much uh, uh, firearms ownership by people in Saskatoon or Yorkton or Melville or moose jaws there is maybe in the urban areas surrounding so there's because everyone comes from that background yes they <laughs> into work or live in the city but yeah you know they still go out and hunt with uncle bill on the farm yeah but you know to that point about the tools i mean and i give a good example i had an 85 year old stakeholder that phoned me and this guy's an amazing fellow and was worried that his gun was going to be part of the confiscation and uh, I said, what do you do? Well, I'm a cattle farmer. He still farms, has 250 head of cattle. So my goodness, you know, what a <laughs> what a diehard. But he goes out every day to check his coyotes. He says, I take my firearm because, of the you know, especially during calving season, right. these coyotes are, are really a problem for him. But I think to myself, well, I imagine he's got an old bolt action Remington traditional rifle. No, he's got a Tavor uh, semi-automatic 
firearm, um, which I totally get the you know use of it because for coyotes it's highly effective. It's you know and they come in a pack. Yeah, and a coyote that's running across a field at forty mile an hour is not exactly the easiest target. And if you don't, you know, dispatch it, he's going to come back the next day, the next day, or he'll come back in the middle of the night and just get smarter. And so you're, you know, you're going to have the problem. So that firearm was on the list, on the amended list that went on to C21 would have been taken away. Now, granted, the government took it off, but there's nothing saying this new advisory group isn't going to put it back on. So they call them assault weapons, but they're modern sporting firearms. I mean, the majority yeah. of firearms since, and I, you can tell from my gray hair, I mean, things have changed over the years. And when I started, I mean, everybody had a, you know, Woodstock typical firearm, but it's yeah. like vehicles. They also had a carburetor on their engine back then, and now they're fuel injected and, we're, and we've got batteries driving right. our vehicles. So all of these firearms changed, but now they're being called assault weapons. And I can't find anything in the criminal code where it talks about assault style firearms. It's not a definition that's ever been made. Exactly. And the, and the, the, the issue around that is I see it is that, you know, anything you use that to commit a crime or an assault or to injure someone or kill somebody, it doesn't matter if it's a tire iron or a, a knife or a gun, it becomes an assault weapon through its use, not by its actual existence. Well, no question. And if you go into Saskatchewan, you know, in Saskatchewan and go across the detachments in Saskatchewan and look at the firearms that they've seized or have been used in crime, I mean, they're sawed off shotguns, they're sawed off rifles, they're improvised devices yeah. where people have actually made a gun out of a piece of uh, gas pipe, which is actually not that difficult, unfortunately. And those are the firearms that they're finding. I mean, they're not finding these assault style firearms. I mean, they're just, you know, they're just, they're not being used. I mean, there's, it's a great optic. They, they look scary, but in all fairness, every firearm that's pointed at someone's scary. And whether it's black or yeah. looks like a military type firearm, I mean, they, they, you know, it's really the end use. And when we look to the American news, I mean, people say, well, look at all the things that are happening in the States. They have no regulation, Senator. They have no vetting. Right. They have no education program. They have no safe storage regulations. Those firearms aren't registered. You know, there there's a totally different paradigm there. Well, and that's the problem that every time there's a big American event, whether it's Uvalde or you know some mass shooting, that's when our government uses that event to uh, promote re more restrictions on gun use. And as you say, it's two completely different worlds. Well, it is. And again, you know what we're trying to do is again is work on the education component to make sure yeah. that, you know, if someone in a community, whether it be rural or urban, you know, isn't properly storing their firearm and someone breaks into their home and steals it, you know, then it becomes, regardless of what it is or who makes it, it now becomes yeah. what I feel, a, you know, assault weapon because it's, you know, someone's going to not use it for the intended purpose of hunting exactly. or target or sports shooting. Now they're stealing it for an illegal purpose. So more work has to be done around that. And I mean, I'd love to see something where the government mandated, you know, potentially that firearms had to be, you know, kept in a vault or a secured room, you know, maybe def tighten up the definition of what storage is and how it's used. Not to say that a farmer who's got a, you know, firearm and readily accessible because he has coyotes coming in his yard attacking his cattle or whatever, he has to have his tool available. Obviously, getting it right. out of the safe isn't going to work. But if they go down to Phoenix for the winter or they go to the Farm Progress show, they should lock it up. Yeah, And most of the firearms owners I'm talking to really support that. And, you know, again, maybe we could include it as something they could put on their taxes uh, taxes as a deduction. Because, you yeah. know, just like we do with car seats or we say we, you put a new furnace in your house to save energy, you know, we'll give you a rebate. There's many things we could do to completely eliminate or, you know, almost totally the, the people having these firearms stolen. Yeah, some positive yeah. incentives rather than, you know, uh, punishment for, for legal gun owners. Well, and one of the things we've done in Saskatchewan, Senators, we've brought in the Saskatchewan Firearms Act. Yeah, And in that act, there's many different areas that we can discuss a little bit further. But one of the key components that I'm very proud of and was initiated by our office was to put in, you know, a provincial offense around unsafe storage of a firearm. So currently, if someone had a firearm stolen because they maybe didn't store properly or it was, you know, in their home. Maybe they left it by the door because they were waiting for 
Caillou to come in, but they didn't lock it up and it got stolen. Or are they going to town? And this right. could be urban as well. And they left it in properly stored in their vehicle and they didn't leave the door locked. Currently, right now, the only alternative for police is either don't charge because the person has no criminal record and they don't want to ruin their life or charge them with a criminal offense where they could eventually be looking at five years in jail, serious fines, having all their firearms chopped up and so forth. So the, we've stepped in now and we've created a provincial offense, much like a speeding ticket. So now we're not going to ignore the charge, like some cases, but we're going to charge them under the provincial act. So now they have to deal with me. So now <laughs> it's going to come into our office. We're going to put their license under review so they can't buy any more guns. We're going to be contacting them and saying, look, that was not a good move. You need to go back to school. You need to get a safe in your house. We're probably going to come and do an inspection. And you're going to send a, uh, sign an undertaking, you know, that you've now been educated. You're not going to have that happen again. And result in maybe a small fine or maybe the charge being stayed once they've come into compliance. But you take that in combination of education and you're going to get a better result. Exactly. Having people's firearms banned, particularly ones that were currently unregistered, which is the vast majority of firearms on the OEC list are unregistered currently. We don't know where they are. Most people don't even know that they're actually in possession of one. And now what? So they say, well, I don't want to give this tool up. I'm like the fellow who hunts coyotes. I mean, right. that's his tool. He uses it every day. Why would he want to turn it in and buy a different tool? And the, mo and the money that he's being offered for the compensation doesn't even cover the cost of what he paid. So you know what's going to happen is they're, they're not going to be in compliance. And now instead of having people who are law-abiding, you force them into a situation where they become un, not law-abiding. And we've tried that with prohibitions on alcohol and booze and, and marijuana. It never worked. We had to go back to licensing and, and having it regulated. So explain what Saskatchewan is doing, because part of it was, I know from the words of the premier, you know, you've got your your law there in Ottawa, which is, um, you know, ill considered and won't accomplish the goal that you've established, or at least you've said that it's uh, it's, it's the motivation behind it. So, so Saskatchewan said, we're going to do our own rules and regulations. We will enforce them in the way that we think is intelligent and smart um, and kind of keep Ottawa and its rules at bay, kind of keep them at the border. Is that how it's going to work? Well, not really. I think, you know, it, it, it could be construed that way, but I think I want to really frame it up a little uh, better. Okay, than please do. And so really what we've done is there's a few things like, first of all, around the OAC and the, and the seizure of firearms. I mean, we went back many, many times to public safety and the RCMP to say, well, what is that going to look like? How are you going to do that? Well, first, they were going to maybe hire some consultants and they put out a tender. and We're going to hire people to bid on it. So who those people were, who knows? Um, then they said, well, maybe we'll use the post office to have them do it. Mm, oh, that's going to be problematic because you're going to have all these guns sitting in a rural post office and somebody's going to break in and steal. And then they said, well, you know, we're going to get the police to do that. And as you know, in Saskatchewan, I mean, we have the same problem everywhere else. I mean, we don't have enough police resources, exactly. even even with providing additional funding. I mean, getting recruits, getting people trained, it's it's problematic. So what we've really done with the Firearms Act is not knowing what is going to happen. We're saying, well, it has to be done properly. We can't have people who are just going home, showing up at somebody's place and say, I'm here to take your fire. Right. I mean, there's so much fraud. There's so much, There's a lot of process that has to take place. So we've put into, into our act, okay, if you're going to seize firearms, this is how it's going to be done. It has to be licensed. You have to have insurance. You have to protect the data because in Australia and New Zealand, they had huge data breaches. Everybody wow. who complied had their name out on the internet, and now they were getting their houses broken into, and you had firearms being stolen. And again, you know that doesn't work. So we've put that into place. We've put in the storage facilities. They have to be kept. But we've also said, okay, if you're going to compensate or, you know, can confiscate people's property, you know, you need to make sure you're paying them for it. And I think all Canadians, whether you're for, for Absolutely. guns or against guns, are saying, well, if yeah. you're going to take someone's property away, you know, you should be properly compensating. Them. And again, they've looked at this many times, like public safety came out with a classification and some compensation, found out that it was woefully inadequate. And that basically people said they weren't going to support it. So they've gone back 
and revisited that. We still haven't seen that list, but we're not waiting for it in Saskatchewan. We've set up a compensation committee that the minister will be putting in, you know, pointing, who will be doing fair market evaluations on these items. And basically, they can't be destroyed until such time as the federal government's paid, the, you know, the stakeholder yeah. the, for their property. So that is another part of the of of the licensing process. And and again, we don't want firearms being chopped up that may be involved in a crime. So if someone's turning in a gun and the government's right. giving them money for it, who's to say that gun wasn't a criminal firearm? You know, we may find out after it's been chopped up and destroyed that it, actually that person may have been involved in a homicide. And we really needed that gun to be part of the evidence, evidence. process. Yeah. And yeah. here we've not only given them money for it, but we've chopped it up before we've done any type of ballistic work on it. So that's yeah. part of what we have in our in our legislation. It so, would be helpful if the people making the rules about guns actually understood something about guns. Well, and again, <laughs> you know, some would say, oh, we're just putting up roadblocks and obstructing the federal government. No, I mean, we're here to to abide by the federal regulations. And But again, we have a responsibility to our citizens in the province to make sure with our, what we believe, constitutional authority under property rights and public safety, that we're making sure yep. whatever is being done is being done properly. The the issue of information that you just raised there sort of along the side, because this was the big problem with the long gun registry is that, you know, everybody's information was being kept by government. And we know how lots of people feel about that. Uh, now they're asking the store owners to um, to keep record of who they sell weapons to and ammunition and, and all the rest of it. So, again, that information exists and will be vulnerable. But it also doesn't capture illegal guns. I mean, the guns that are being run across the border or coming from all sorts of sources that, you know, that's not going to be kept somewhere. So, again, you're making the legal gun owner more vulnerable because they're the only ones whose information is being collected. Well, and there's no question. I mean, the, the, having the stores keep track of firearms that they've sold to an individual and proving that the license they have is valid. To yeah. be honest with you, I support that because we did yeah, have people I think that's who, reasonable. You, know, yeah. you know, we had people where we revoked their license and, and you know, they kind of went in, went into hiding and we weren't able to get the license from them or police weren't able to get the license from them. Mm -hmm. And they'd go into a gun store and buy a firearm. So verifying that the license is still valid and, that, you know, just because they have the license doesn't mean it's valid. They can now check it, make sure that it's valid right. and then record what they sold to them has a lot of impact on straw purchasing and so forth. So if you're using the information for in the proper process, there's I have no challenge with it. And frankly, I don't think the stores do either. But yeah. yeah but again, to your point though, about and I really want to raise this issue, and this is a very, very critical issue, is that there's been a lot of talk in the legislature, and it was in the House of Commons last week when they talked about 3D guns, you know, manufactured yeah. guns. And how this legislation is so important. And I support that. I mean, I totally support the fact that they don't want people building illegal guns. But here's the problem. What you've done with the handgun ban in C-21 is you've actually, I've you know, jokingly said it's the best thing to eliminate 3D guns because nobody needs to build one anymore because the existing ones are going to go underground. And here's yeah. the way, and let me explain that. Yeah. So we've, every single day in our office, I get people that are calling and saying, hey, Uncle Fred passed away or Uncle Fred has to go into this, you know, uh, care home. In your home, yeah. You know, we've gone over and Uncle Fred's got some handguns he's had for 50 years and he's owned responsibly and probably took his kids and his children out, you know, to a range and went target shooting. Well, now there's no way for those firearms and the value of those firearms to be transferred to another individual. So if they doesn't matter if they willed them or they've given power of attorney or there's no way to take those firearms and dispose of them in any other manner other than to give them to the police to have them chopped up. So when they call us and say, well, I want Uncle Jimmy to have these guidance and he has a license, uh, can I transfer them? Well, no, C-21 doesn't allow for that. So we have to tell them, well, you need to call up your police agency and come and yeah. destroy thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, could be $50,000 worth of firearms. Or something with sentimental value. You know, or you historical value. With your, yes, exactly. So what ends up happening is these people aren't even savvy sometimes on the firearms legislation. So Uncle Jimmy says, oh, I've got a firearms license and I'll just come and take the stuff. So now these firearms end up over at Uncle Jimmy's. Uncle Jimmy's got them out in the barn and he hasn't created, created any kind of criminal issue. But now Uncle Jimmy's, 
gets broken into and they steal the guns, he's certainly not going to call up the police and say, hey, I just had these guns at Uncle Fred's and, you know, you need to investigate this theft. Well, they're not going to yeah. say anything. So now you've got this underground channel and it happened previously back in the gun registries you brought up earlier. Yeah. Is the handguns were on an old registry system that were supposed to get moved over and re-register in the new system. In Saskatchewan right now, the latest numbers I've heard is over 10,000 handguns that disappeared 20, 30 years ago. No one's ever looked into. No one's ever There's tried. Somewhere. Where. Yeah. There's somewhere, but we have no idea where. So my really um, goal is to try to see if we can bring in some mechanism where the CFO, myself or others, can actually allow those transfers to take place where they can move that over to another licensed individual who we now know and control and has safe storage. You haven't increased the number of handguns in the country. You've shut them down on the import side. Right. All you're doing is if Bob has five and Senator Wallen has four and I sell you one, now you have five and I have four. You haven't changed the right. complexity of public safety in Canada. You've just re allotted who has the firearms who are heavily vetted and licensed. So, you know, and, and you've got a record of it, which is supposedly what we're trying to accomplish here. Absolutely. And and the, and again, if the safe storage, back to what I said, you know, if we tighten up the storage, yep. you know, and sometimes we've already got enough legislation, but it needs more education. And yep. so that's where we need to be spending the money, not putting out ads saying we're, we're, we're taking assault style firearms off the streets and making Canadians safer. We need to put out messaging talking about make sure you're locking up your firearms and ammunition, making sure you're keeping your license current. And making sure the people in your family who are exposed to those firearms are also licensed and in compliant. And educated. I mean, we can do so much more there. No, I mean, it, look, and, and it is a different, I mean, that's how I grew up. My father was a hunter and and also part of the Wildlife uh, Federation and and took me hunting when I was young and taught me the power of a gun. And and I, I personally will never own one because I spend most of my time in urban settings. Um mm -hmm in Ottawa and other places so I, I but but it was an education it was it, he also when he came home from hunting he cleaned his guns he put it away all the ammunition and that was all part of our education about how you treat this tool it's like anything else you don't leave your hammer out in the rain and let it get rusty um you know you you treat it with some respect the other thing that must have you tearing your hair out is is this whole notion of the um the prosecution of criminals and the bail reform and all of those issues that are surrounding that mandatory minimums for crimes uh, and i i don't know whether you'll know whether this is correct or not but so at the same time that they're doing c21 we've got uh, bill c5 to scrap mandatory minimum min minimums um so they're eliminating mandatory sentences for those charged with robbery with a firearm, extortion with a firearm, importing or exporting unauthorized firearms, or discharging a firearm with intent. Is that the case as you understand it? Well, that's the case. I mean, but again, the um, when we talked about increasing the penalties for smugglers from you know 10 years to 14 years to 14 yeah i mean it all sounds great i i'm full, fully in support of it. i make it 24 years as far as i'm concerned but they're no but right now they haven't they've never not one single time has anyone been charged and and received a sentence that even went to the maximum currently of 10, of 10. years That's and then we've got people who are constantly in and out of the system where they get arrested they've got firearms yeah. prohibitions on them they go into court or jail and then they, they get caught cut loose in a few hours to go back out on the street. And I, I just, I, and chances are they already have more firearms. If they had the one that was in the vehicle, maybe that they got found with, right. they probably have easy access to many others. And so they just go and replenish their inventory and maybe even retaliate against the person who they feel may have resulted in their conviction. So, I mean, it just goes on and on. So, yeah, so uh, I just wanted to check that because I read that and I was stunned that not one single person in this country has ever been sentenced to the maximum of 10 years. Uh, and so moving the punishment to 14 years means absolutely nothing. No. Yeah. And again, you know, Senator, in all fairness, I mean, fortunately, because I live in Saskatchewan and the government we have, I mean, I've got the fund I need to do the job and my, yeah. my, uh, colleagues that are CFOs in many other provinces in Canada, 
including Nova Scotia, which uh, you know started this whole process with that horrible, horrible uh, mass murder there. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, the amount of money that's being received by these CFOs to operate is so minimal. And then on top of it, now you're adding all these other responsibilities where the CFOs are supposed to be revoking the owner's license and making sure that the firearms are, you know, being removed and all these other things. I mean, where is that resource going to come from if there isn't federal funding? And many of these folks are under a five-year contribution agreement right now where they're locked in on their funding for the next five years. So I haven't seen anything in in the legislation and maybe it's going to come out in some other manner. But, you know, again, if you're going to bring in this type of legislation, it's very reliant on having these folks particularly in the CFO offices, delivering these services and, and taking on these responsibilities. So you get no money from the federal government? No, we've we've been negotiating with them since we've taken over. Um, they've made some offers to us, but, you know, our, our province has said, you know, you're not even close to covering the expenses and we're certainly not going to sign on to something that is unreasonable. So we're, we're still trying to, you know, to work towards that um, objective. I mean, they... Obviously, the funds that come in from licensed owners, gun stores, and other that pay fees go to the federal government. We yeah. don't receive those fees. So under the legislation, they're supposed to make their best effort to, to develop a contribution agreement with their partners in the provincial offices who deliver the services. But at this point, that we're still negotiating. And Are you putting any of that forward as amendments to this legislation to, to say, look, at least the money that's paid by you know, Saskatchewanians or Nova Scotians or whoever it is should at least come back to the province for um, implementation, for protection, well, for the efforts. Absolutely. And I mean, that's one of the things I've been speaking with the senators on as well that I'd like to see as yeah. amendment. And again, I mean, they, can, we, they can't be um, paying for something that's not re- related to the program, but we, we issue, you know, our, our quarterly reports and Here's what we spent. Here's what we've got for resources. Here's what we've accomplished. And again, um, you know, if they if they aren't and if they're ineligible expenses, obviously we wouldn't expect the feds to pay for. Them. But at right. the same token, if we're delivering the service, and right now, let's face it, gun crime is going up and up and up. I mean, we need to do more and more. At the end of the day, I think that the federal government should be saying if you submit an invoice that from your province that is reasonable and uh, cut captures the expenses that are needed to do this work, we're going to pay for that. And um, right now, that's not the case. And that's separate and apart from beefing up police forces, the kind of things we heard from the Mass Casualty Commission that, you know, I mean, we we experience here, if if you live in on a farm in Saskatchewan, the the RCMP is likely to tell you to go in the house and lock the door because it'll take them two or three hours to get there. We We can't even deal with basic crime of people stealing you know gas off a uh, off a farm well and see that's one of the things we did different with our model when i took over i i like to refer to it as a building a new ship to sail on an old sea i mean all of our firearms officer including ourselves are sworn special yeah. constables and so we have abilities to go out and do additional work and as you know the province is bringing in marshals and other things all of yeah. these things are provincially funded re- initiatives but why? So that when we do have that individual who's not in compliance and we're needing to get in there from a public safety issue to make sure those firearms are out of there, that if the police resources, which are heavily taxed and we work with the police all the time, you know, we, they need support. They need someone that is especially around the firearms laws. I mean, it's so complex, you know, the Firearms Act and the criminal code and how the two interact. I mean, I have a lawyer next to me and we're hiring two more. And so, you know, part of it is to help our partners in policing understand what charges should be laid, what authorities they have and don't have. And again, all of these things are part and parcel of beefing up the process. You can't just put more police on the street. You need the regulators. You need the CFO offices. You need the legal folks that know the firearms legislation to make it successful. And again, we're happy to share that model with with anyone. But um, again, right now, we haven't really had, you know, we've had some discussions, but we certainly haven't had input uh, or nor have you seen any of those type of things in C21. This is part of the problem. It's just this lack of consultation with people who are informed about it. Uh, so you're at this point wanting to propose some amendments to C21, but but basically we'd be better just 
to stop it and fix it as opposed to trying to put some band-aids on it. Well, I mean, that's one obviously up to the Senate and the government to decide, yeah. but but you know, I, I think it's um there is there is a lot of work that needs to be done there. I don't think it's a patchwork quilt approach to this is the answer. And that's the reason why the current firearms legislation is so complex. I mean, we have legal folks here that are pouring over and back and forth and back and forth. There's so many areas of interpretation. There's so many gray areas. There's so many areas that fall back on the criminal code and the criminal code falls back on the firearms act. I mean, it's really, really difficult to interpret it. And the reason being is that every single time that it's been tweaked, we've seen what we're seeing now. Amendments added, taken away, put in, put in the criminal code, then put over into the other side. Then we've got the OAC that's overriding on top of all that. I mean, it's, I do this every single day and I get questions every single day that I can't answer. And I have yeah. to go back to our legal team and spend a week trying to get an answer. Well, how can Canadians understand it or stay in compliance with it if we can't even necessarily give them an answer easily as to what their options are or what the legislation speaks to? Thank you so much for this. I, I, I'm sure we'll be back to you because as we wrestle with it uh, and Canadians wrestle with it and provinces figure out how to try and operate within uh, the confines of some very confusing laws. I think I think we'll need your help again. So thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you. And I, I hope I was able to bring a little clarity to it. Yes, I, I think you were. And I hope we see you in Ottawa explaining this in, in front of the Senate. Robert Freeberg is Saskatchewan's chief firearms officer, the person appointed by the government uh, to try and A, understand and B, monitor and implement all these uh, these rules and regulations, both federally and provincially. I don't think anybody, um, uh, we're, we're very glad you've stood up for the job. Let's put it that way. There's not going to be a lot of volunteers on this one. Thanks so much, Mr. Freeberg. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Okay, we'll talk again soon. And that's it for this edition of No Nonsense with Pamela Wallen. We'll see you again soon as well.